So hello everyone, welcome to another video from EGIS Associates. We're here at the North Carolina GIS Conference in Winston-Salem, and we're sitting at the Bradshaw uh, Consulting Services booth with Dale Loberger. So they're a well-known uh, GIS provider in the public safety industry, based out of Aiken, South Carolina, that's I correct. believe that's correct. So um, what I wanna do, for the folks that aren't able to come to the conference and a lot of folks can't get out and travel, is really kind of talk about where you see GIS impacting, you know, public safety, you know, emergency response, uh, you know, because of all the all the things. I mean, we have crazy weather going on. I, I think yeah. it's been raining straight here in the southeast since like October. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've had maybe a, a week of sun, so we've had flooding issues, and of course the hurricanes that hit here in North Carolina. Uh, late last year. I know I had to cancel some classes and things because of it when I was coming up here and then you know the wildfires that are happening out in, in the west so you know seeing what's happening and how GIS is really helping communities respond to those issues I think is pretty critical so with with that Dale you know what, what do you see how, how is this really impacting from your your business and what you're seeing um, how, how is GIS being used to help solve some of these problems all right Okay, so I want to break in here real quick because I realized that I forgot to ask Dale to introduce himself. And I want y'all to know who he is and why um, what he's saying matters. So I've known Dale for a very long time, for over 10, maybe even 15 years now. He is truly a GIS guru and knows his stuff where public safety is concerned. He has over 30 years in GIS including 20 with Esri and over eight with Bradshaw Consulting. He's also a certified EMT and firefighter. So he knows what, uh, let me rephrase that, how these technologies, GIS, geospatial, are being really utilized out there in the field with um, you know, those people that are out there trying to save people's lives. So he really does know that. He also has a master's degree from NC State in GIS and forestry. Uh, plus, he is a history buff. And by that, I mean, he really, you know, gets into it. He, he, like me, uh, before I started EGIS, I was a living historian or reenactor, is sometimes called. And Dale and I both did uh, the colonial period and the American Revolutionary period uh at various events uh, across the the u.s mostly here on the eastern coast of the united states where of course that was where stuff was happening uh from the european side of things anyway and that's where i got to know him uh, i actually did not know he was involved in gis at all at the time but uh, we both have an interest in historical surveying and he has period equipment you know pole compasses, Gunther's chains, plane tables, and we've done a couple of events together where we actually utilize equipment to lay out a military camp or uh, survey a town and enjoy showing that, demonstrating those techniques to the public so they get a better idea of how a lot of the data we use in GIS was originally collected before GPS or before total stations, computers, and all those things. Uh, we're out there. So, yeah, I've known Dale for a long time. Matter of fact, the, the first time I saw him in associate with GAS was I actually showed up to the Esri office in Charlotte, North Carolina for a training session and got off the elevator and he was there in the lobby and we both kind of turned to look at each other and said, what are you doing here? And so that's how we kind of both <laughs> realized we also had this shared interest in geospatial technology. So, yeah, as I said, Dale really knows his stuff. So with that, we'll go back to the interview. Well, thanks for doing this trip. I think this is great for, for folks that couldn't be here uh, to have a chance to, to see what's going on. So I appreciate you doing this. Um, there has been a lot of disasters happening lately, and that certainly is a challenge uh, for a lot of services, whether it's fire, police, EMS. Um, but the other challenge is just what happens every day to day, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so if you can handle things on the day-to-day -day basis, usually you can handle the, the disasters uh, that, that come up as well. So while we do help with those uh, specific situations that come up with disasters, we also help on a day-to-day basis. Um, we, uh, we definitely see GIS as being uh, a huge tool 
within public safety. And, you know, whether you're talking about police, fire, or EMS, they all use it very, very differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, one of the things that is very important, uh, and hopefully everybody understands, is that underlying the, the really cool things that, that we do is a good address database and routable network database. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a very critical piece to have. So, uh, go ahead. so that, that's a good point. You know, working with a lot of the municipalities I, I've worked with over the years, I've found that usually that's probably one of the weakest areas. You know, they have good parcel data, uh, they have good zoning information, they may even have good you know utility, but but addresses or a, a truly routable road network. Yep. Um, is, is something a lot of them are missing. So how do you, when you go in and trying to help these folks and, and get your system set up, how, is, is that something you help them with? I mean, what, what is the biggest challenge you see to getting that kind of thing going for the, these folks? Okay. It, it certainly is a challenge, and uh, we can help in some ways. Uh, one of the things that we have is an in-vehicle client, and it actually um, you know, relies on a good routable network. And the first time that you have a crew driving with that in-vehicle client and it tells you to turn left off of a bridge, you've, you've lost it. Um, and they don't no longer trust the system. So having that foundation is, is really, really, really critical um, beyond just the parcels mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but one of the ways that we solve that is going with commercial data, which I think is really a shame because there's a lot of good GIS people out there that have a lot of good data. But the network routing tends to be something that isn't given as much of attention mm-hmm. as, as some of the other um, uh, maybe low, lower hanging fruit. Yes. <laughs> uh, getting your parcels right and all that for assessment, that's, that's all good and important stuff, valuable for uh, local governments as well. So having good routable data is critical. <clears throat> there are commercial vendors out there that have data, mm-hmm. but it's really best if a community can do its own data. Because waiting on TomTom or Google or anybody else to update their data, that's that's really not the best situation. If you can maintain your own data, um, then you have control over that. And we're doing some interesting things with that. Well, why don't you show us, since we've got this wonderful, nice, I love the Samsung <laughs> Curve monitor. That's a, yes. a nice one. I don't know if it comes out across as well on, on uh, TV here, but this is a wonderful display. Um, but it's not what we sell. So, no. <laughs> I'm a tech guy in IT. <clears throat> yep. As the channel knows, I do some unboxing videos. So, yeah, I'm excited with, with that. So, this is, I think, your, your marvelous product yep. or suite of products. It, yes. It, it's more than one thing. So, why don't you kind of tell us what you got going on here? Yeah, it's, it's an entire suite of products. Um, it does several things. Um, and. Uh, a little hard to see right now because the units are, are kind of uh, toward the center of the city. But the but nice thing is I'll be able to zoom in when I oh, have the video. Good, good. <laughs> uh, in the uh, center of the map is a um, demand surface. So based on call history, mm-hmm. we can actually look at where calls have come from in the past for certain hours of the day, certain days of the week, times of the year. And so we can actually forecast the likelihood of calls to come from certain areas. And uh, people always ask, you know, you can't forecast where an accident is going to happen. And the reality is you can, uh, a lot more than what people think. Uh, the demand surfaces we create tend to be about 80 to 85 percent of the calls that actually come in in the next hour fall inside those zones. So if, if we know the vast majority of where calls are going to come from, we can actually prepare to respond for those calls ahead of time. So, so you're a lot more accurate than the weatherman on predicting these kind of things. Is it, is I'd, what I'd like to think so. We have some of our customers uh, talk about us like uh, the weather map. So they see the demand surface shifting and, and changing. Um, some, some services call it chasing the blob. Uh, so we, they know where those calls are going to be coming from, and they can actually respond faster. And this is an industry where if you can save 15, 20 seconds, that's considered significant. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of customers that save a minute or more on wow. their uh, average or 90th percentile response times. Yeah, that literally is the difference between life and death in, in some cases. In a lot of cases it is. Um, in, in fact, one of our customers, Jersey City, uh, actually looked at 
their number of uh, return of spontaneous circulation, basically returning heartbeats on patients. And they found that as their response times got closer to four minutes, they actually were saving more lives. Um, another customer actually found that their uh, murder rate had gone down in their city. But what it actually came down to is the fact that EMS was getting to patients quicker and they were actually viable patients that can be brought to the hospital rather than turning into fatalities right off. <laughs> so GIS can have a real impact on lives. Oh, absolutely. So, so is this all coming, I assume, web services or feeding this? Actually, it's not. Um, because public safety tends to like things very controlled, uh, we talk directly to the CAD. The CAD is always local within the, the PSAP, the Public Safety Answering Point. That's the dispatch center. So just to clarify, because we have CAD means a lot of different oh, things. Right? Yes, yes. So we're thank talking you. about computer aided dispatch, not computer aided design and drafting. Right? Exactly. So not yes. CAD or micro, but but <laughs> right. what nine one one is using this is, for dispatch. This is where the nine one one calls come into. Thank you for that <laughs> clarification. Um, yeah. So when the calls come in to the dispatch center, they get logged in this database, and what we get is a direct feed from that. They also have AVL automated vehicle location, just for, to define that. So it brings in the positions of where the vehicles are. So as the vehicles are moving around in the map, we actually calculate what their service area is if they're an available vehicle. And then that's plotted on top of that demand surface. So we're getting a good measure, right, right now it's not maybe a great measure, but a good measure of our ability to service the demand that we expect right now because we have that live connection. But it all comes directly from that database that's in the dispatch center. And the Marvelous server also sits in the dispatch center as well. Okay. We, so, we do have a new version, though, that's mm -hmm. coming out that will be uh, web hosted mm -hmm. uh, that allows us to take our... Uh, vehicle locations mm -hmm. and generalize those up to uh, an Amazon instance mm -hmm. that can then be pulled down by adjacent services that run Marvelous uh, okay. for mutual aid. Okay. So I imagine that would be something good, you know, if you're looking at in a disaster situation, because a lot of times in those, the local infrastructure is wiped out, even in some of the hardened EOCs. <coughs> that having that in a cloud situation like that would then make that available, assuming you get a cell signal or some internet connection involved with it. And that is something that I, in talking to people, doing these needs assessment things, we try to talk about that data uh -huh. redundancy, that ability, yeah. what happens if worst case scenario. Yeah, contingency is a big uh, big factor, and the other is security. Yeah. Um, you know, HIPAA is one of those laws, you can't let information out about yeah, you know, what's going on with a specific patient? And as I understand that for folks that you're using Arc Online, that it does, while it is a secure platform, I don't want to say <laughs> it's not, uh, but it doesn't have the security requirements to meet the HEPA requirements, or at least it didn't. Is that changed? In your I, I believe you may have to ask Esri about that, but I believe that they have made some changes okay. uh, in that. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about HIPAA as well. What that really mm -hmm. means but the the thing that makes people so afraid is that any violation of HIPAA is a significant, significant. Uh, fine. fine for that so that that makes people very very cautious mm -hmm. I understand we don't like to spend money we don't have to right <laughs> yes uh, especially for in local government our yep. tax dollars are, are very small on that. so so what other products do you have that are part of the marvelous that plug into this like is this the same thing that you have running on the, is this an well, iPad? It, yeah, it's not the same thing. Yeah, that's an iPad right there. So uh, that's our in-vehicle client. So uh, when calls come into the dispatch center, I'll come back to this screen for a minute. So there's the underlying demand surface that's created by a product we call the demand monitor. So that's one piece. Mm -hmm. So if people don't want that, they don't have to install that. Um, the, another piece that's here is as calls come into the CAD, we see each call. It pops in at the top, the newest call, and it automatically looks at what are the three closest vehicles to that call and what is their response time to that specific mm -hmm. incident. And they're all color-coded by their availability, uh, their status at the time, uh, as well as the importance of the call. So the dispatchers have all the information they need to make the call of who should respond. Once they make that decision and they dispatch a vehicle, it automatically comes to their, their MDT, um, their local device, so in EMS, it's largely been Windows devices in the mm -hmm. past. Uh, we've had some fire customers that actually said, hey, 
you know, we can break anything you give us. <laughs> An iPad's much cheaper. Yes. You can replace a lot of those for a single uh, Windows Tough Book. Um, but it, uh, so we redesigned our application to run inside iOS as a native uh, client. And uh, we provide all the information that uh, a crew needs. So it, it comes up with the details about the call, any uh, notes that come in from the dispatchers all come up automatically. We give a route based on your, your uh, data. Yep. <laughs> we give a route to, uh, to that vehicle or to that incident. And one of the things we can do to build impedances on that that's kind of unique is we have something called the impedance monitor that looks at your AVL history. So a lot of times we can't travel at the speed limit. Yep. Um, yeah, there's a lot of areas that have congestion and you're below the speed limit. There's other times where an emergency vehicle could go beyond the speed limit. So what we do is instead of looking at speed limits, we look at how fast has an ambulance or a fire truck responded to a call in a particular direction during a certain time of the day and actually build impedances that are time of day unique for how we respond to emergencies. And then now we have a new version that allows us to integrate Waze data and the way most people integrate Waze is sort of throw all the control over to Google and use their streets data. And again, we want to use your local data wherever possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we do is we actually take the barriers from Waze and then attach that to your street network. So we have the impedance monitor data, so we have your AVL history creating better impedances, and then we have Waze giving us current real-time slowdowns, closures, to give us really good data that we can use for calculating uh, the, the run order, for uh, calculating routes that we give to uh, out to the vehicles. But you're an EMT and actually ride with ambulances. From the routing perspective, I mean, your local, you know, how much do you pay attention to what the, the, the tablet's telling you on how to get somewhere versus, you know, your own local experiences? Yeah, and I am both an EMT and I, I work with Union EMS, uh, and, or I work with an EMS service. Yep. <laughs> um, I also am a fireman, and I've, I've noticed a big difference. Uh, when I'm in my own fire district, I know that district very well. And in my head, I can usually figure out how is the best way to get someplace. Within the EMS world, I can be anywhere in the county. So it's not just a typically a local area that I work in. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's hard to know everywhere in the entire county, even though I've lived in my county for 20 some years. Um, so I, I do rely on it. And the other thing that is really big in my county, uh, Union, is traffic. Mm -hmm. We have Highway 74, we have a new expressway. So some things are actually changing. And with the uh, traffic patterns, it's nice to have a little bit of help to tell me how do I get someplace. Um, and also to help me figure out what is the closest hospital to take this patient to. So depending on what, how they're presenting, um, you know, gee, am I closer now to, to Matthews, to you know, Monroe? So I, I can actually make that decision because we automatically, when you say that you're going to transport a patient, it comes up with the distance to each of the hospitals as destinations. And when I select one of those, it gives me a route to the hospital as well. So, well, and I guess it also takes into account, because you've said integrate with ways, traffic, things that you don't know when you're sitting on site to get to whatever hospital. So I imagine that is a, is a help. Yeah. There's a lot of times we think we know the best answer for everything, mm -hmm. um, but we don't know when an accident has happened. So when there are closures. Another really good example, going back to the floods and so forth, um, last year there, were a lot of, there was a lot of flooding in South Carolina. And uh, Lexington County EMS uh, was inputting all the road closures. Um, so Marvelous was routing ambulances to get to calls through all these closures that individual crews wouldn't have known about. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, fire didn't have access to those same things. So they were responding to the same calls, but they were constantly having to radio to dispatch saying, hey, I've come up on a, a flooded, road, <laughs> a flooded road. Give me a different route how to get there. And uh, the fire chief finally realized that, hey, EMS isn't doing this. Why aren't they calling in? And uh, the EMS director said, because we, we know where the closures are and we're routing around those. So it was a, a very good uh, case in point. Well, yeah, I mean, that certainly sells the, the, the value of the, the whole system, the GIS and everything. When you can 
kind of go, I hate to say this, but nan 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 <laughs> to, to the other groups that aren't using it, right? I mean, That's not what I meant to say, but, well, but it was I, a good example. Fun, but yeah, so, and, and this is really cool. And so we've talked about the dispatcher, we've talked about the vehicles, but what about upper management? What, yes. what kind of reporting dashboards? I mean, that's kind of the operational dashboards are one of the big buzzwords out there now yeah. in GIS and just asset man, everything we talk about. So I assume you have something similar like that that provides that kind of information to the, the fire chiefs, the uh, emergency management directors, and they can even be shared out potentially with FEMA or your state emergency management agencies and those things. Definitely. Everybody has to have a dashboard. <laughs> so this is another product. We call it the PSAP monitor. Uh, I mentioned earlier the PSAP is the Public Safety Answering Point Dispatch Center. So this can be across multiple uh, agencies. So if we drilled into uh, EMS, for instance, we can look. Well, all right. So it shows me how many calls are going on in certain areas. So I know where my resources are being used. We can... Uh, Come out here looking, just drill into law enforcement here. And uh, again, it would do the same thing. So you can drill into any discipline if you'd like. And all that can be controlled through login. So, you know, only EMS can see EMS, only police can see police. But one of the things it would do is automatically calculate for me my 90th percentile response times. And that's really important because a lot of dashboards, you know, they, people talk about what is your average response. And nobody in public safety, not in EMS and fire, care about. Where, how do we do half the time? They want to know 90% of the time, am I on time? And so this will actually calculate my 90th percentile response times for today, for this week, this month. And the great thing is, um, I always look at our fire reports, our run reports mm -hmm. for last month, and I can see how we did last month. Well, making decisions this month based on last month's data is only of you know, limited value. Mm -hmm. But if I know during the month or during the day, during the week, how am I doing, I can actually make management decisions as to how to improve uh, those things. So having a dashboard like this that gives me access to uh, you know, data, seeing vehicles, seeing incidents, getting real-time statistics is a huge help. Oh, yeah. So is that configurable to show more? I, I assume it is, <laughs> since most dashboards oh. are. You just plug the different widgets in where you want them kind of thing. Ab it? Absolutely. You're a great straight guy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's everything is configurable. Um, you know, what units you want to see, what agencies you want to see, who can see those. All those are controlled by logins and configurations within the system. Okay. So, cool. well, I know one of the concerns a lot of folks working in the public safety environment are, are looking for or looking towards in the future is next-gen 911. So first, if you could quickly explain what Next Gen 911 is in a very quick, and I know that's a it's a hard <laughs> thing, but kind of explain for those that may not quite be aware of that. Uh, and then, is does this help in compliance with that? Um, and what are some of the challenges your clients are facing with the just regardless whether they're you know looking at your problem whatever, just facing with having to deal with Next Gen 911. And that's a Great question. I think everyone in GIS should understand NextGen 911. Um, and if I can make it really, really simple, um, in the way that the process has worked up till now, is we have uh, these Annie and Allie, uh, the automated number index, automated location. Uh, but there, there are these uh, data that comes from the phone number that you're calling. Um, so it, when we all had landlines, uh, we all remember those rotary phones. <laughs> when you well, used to some call, some of us remember. So, I'm not so sure everybody. <laughs> it's on the YouTube. But <laughs> so so when you picked up that landline and called in the past, they knew where you were calling from. They knew the address, uh, the MSAG, it's called, and they could determine who would respond for fire, or for police, or for EMS to that address. Well, now we all run around with cell phones, um, so we don't have that address that we tie back to. And so it's a new way of figuring out where are we. So in the past, we've looked at what cell towers are you pinging? Um, and that sort of narrows us down to a half mile or so area, which is not very good. So the whole thing about NG911 is we replace this idea of Annie and Allie and, and MSAG with GIS. And that is huge to any GIS manager, people that are out there that worked in public safety. This is 
this is big news for you. This is huge value that you can provide. So now GIS is the the guiding uh, tool at that lowest so really level. That foundation data set that's going to be used to direct An, everything. Yes, not only a foundation, but I mean it's an integral piece in how 911 works in the future. So it's kind of like the, the keystone <clears throat> in an arch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so we have to have good address data. Um, so another product that BCS offers is called the Addresser. Um, and this helps you maintain addresses. Uh, and we have another piece of that that people can purchase called the First Aid Kit. And that gives them uh, a very inexpensive tool that can go through and look at their data and tell you where your addresses are out of range, where they're out of sync, things that are, are not appropriate. Um, that are going to make responses more difficult, make 911 more difficult. So uh, this is a, it's a great way to look at how good is my data. We're all, we're all proud of our data. I have good data. Um, and I have surprised a lot of people by running their data through the first aid kit, and it starts listing out some of the errors that are there. But that's something we all need to know. We need to face mm -hmm. up that our data is constantly changing, constantly needs updating. And so we need tools that allow us to see those things, make those edits so that that critical piece in responding to people is so, available. So really with Next Gen 911, what we're looking at is that it's going to be really harder to rely on publicly or commercially provided data sets because they're not going to be accurate or clean enough to support Next Gen 911 operations. And so that anyone in local government is really now going to have to step up they don't have clean addresses, routable networks, they're going to kind of be, and I hate to use the word forced, but uh, as my dad, who used to be a city engineer, would call these unfunded mandates <laughs> yeah. to, to get that stuff cleaned up. So this is something that if you're working in local government, you're going to have to step up and start doing, even if you've never done it in the past. Is that sure? Sure. We can, we can call it an unfunded mandate, but you know, back when I was at Esri 20, 30 years ago, this was all doable stuff back then. This is stuff GIS should have been doing for a long time. And I'll, I'll be very honest about that. Yeah, if I meet any of you in person, I'll, <laughs> I'll say the same thing. GIS should be doing this stuff anyway. And it's of so much value beyond 911. I mean, routing your meter readers and um, yeah, everybody else that does things in local government does need to know where the addresses are. They do need to know how to get through the network. So this is something we should be doing just to prove that we have value in general. Well, I would agree with that. I think what has happened is the other things have taken, because we do have commercially available data that works with the CAD systems, that you know it doesn't drive necessarily revenue, like having your tax parcels done, your zoning, your permitting done, and you know, again, routing, if you're working for a small city or even a large city, most of your meter readers know where they, they get on a route. They just do it all the time. Um, so I think that's why we, you're right, we, we've been able to do it for forever. Yeah. But I don't think, it hasn't been a priority. And at least that's my opinion on why we haven't done more of that within our own realm. Plus, I know me personally, I try to avoid anything that deals with 911 like the play because <laughs> I don't want the liability. <laughs> yeah. I, honestly. Um, and, and I... I hate every time I go in someplace and have to recommend commercial data because the local data is not available or it's not up to snuff yeah. um, that to support the applications that we need. GIS really needs, you know, I understand the, the liability, I understand the fear of getting involved in 911, but we need to be there. As GS professionals, uh, we need to be involved. Well, in and, I, and I agree. You're, you're absolutely right with that. Um, and I think next year 911 is going to be one of those factors. That it is going to drive push us. us. Just like GASB 34 did with asset management yep. and other, other things like that. So um, I think this has been great, Dale. I appreciate you taking the time to sit with us and, and talk with our, our, our viewers and, and talk about the great products that Bradshaw Consulting brings to the table. Uh, I will be providing a link, and I won't make you hold that anymore. To, to Bradshaw's website and to their marvelous products if you want to find out more and get in contact with Dale or any of the great folks at Bradshaw Consulting. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll sign off and go back to the, the conference. So thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much, Trip. I appreciate it. I think that went pretty good. good.